Luke. Right then, Luke. Yeah, I think this is in your wheelhouse. Uh, this from Carlos on Discord. Good to have you on board, Carlos. Great to have a Carlos there. It is. Mm. Come on. It is. Don't see many Carloses around. Favourite Carlos? Well, I see Roberto your... immediately. <laughs> sleeps to mind. <laughs> Obviously, Carlos on Discord would be yeah. at the top of the shop. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, I was going to say, a lot of quite tedious people in the UK mm. will have a friend called Carl, and they'll call them Carlos to make them sound more dramatic than they are. Charles. This guy, yeah. The so, king, for crying out loud. Exactly. This, hey. did he, do people still call him Carl? Uh, I don't think they ever have, but Charles is Carlos is Charles in Spanish. I That's reckon right. before the schism, Prince Harry would have come in and gone, all right, Carlos. Yeah. <laughs> oh, he's Carlos. a bit cheeky, isn't and, he? And King Carlo Ancelotti. Anyway, enough of Carlos and Carls and all that it's, bollocks. It's, it's, one thing we can all agree upon, though, mm. it's great to have Carlos with us. Indeed. Um, every weekend, Carlos begins, uh, every weekend we're seeing supporters cry conspiracy when decisions don't go their way. How can we address this culture of conspiracy theories that's becoming more prevalent in Premier League fan discourse? Is this damaging the spirit of the game and what role do pundits and social media play in either fueling or fighting these narratives? It's a really, really good question. It is. It is. Sadly and pertinent. And I think it's part of the reason, or in fact maybe even the main reason why this is such a good question, is because it's what it's reflective of a wider issue in society generally. It is. And and obviously, as ever, football, whether it's Premier League yeah. football or football generally, is, is, is only ever going to be made up of the society that it's a part of. But we really, as you know, well as, as you know as well as I do, we genuinely don't have time to tackle that issue because we'd be here for years. We would. Um, but focusing on the football... Just, well, just, just until Andy fo- goes and plays paddle. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't, I, there's no such sport as paddle. It's just a conspiracy. <laughs> I, well, I've never exists? seen it. I've never seen it. You ever played it? No. No, I haven't. Is, is, have you ever played the game? <laughs> it, it, it's tennis with Ben Arthur. That's what it is. <laughs> yeah, it is. So let me let me let me answer this. Let me answer. Let me give this a go. Go on. Okay. So I've got I've got thoughts. I about you do. So in terms of what Carlos has specifically asked, there's a number of different questions in there, um, and so I'll try and work through them, and then obviously get you guys back in. So it is wider of it is indicative of a wider problem, and I think we have seen a since the advent of ad, advent of social media and, and the internet more broadly, I suppose, but certainly more recently in this kind of. This this era we live in, where a lot of people actually, frightening as it sounds, don't really know what's real and what isn't. Yeah. Right. They're presented with information, whether it's a an image or a news story or a comment or a tweet, and they actually have no real way mm-hmm. these days of knowing whether it's actually real or not. And that now extrapolates to an opinion. Yeah. Well, it, and, and and the whole thing kind of stems mm. from there. Back in the day, without getting to Uncle Albert about it. it you never really used to hear too much in the way of conspiracy theories about why teams were losing games or why teams won a trophy or why a player got injured or whatever. You used to hear them a little bit, but it felt like to me they never really had the fuel to get off the ground because it was always Man United to get all the decisions. That was really yeah, the only that was one. basically it. And you never really and it also just crucially it didn't have a vehicle mm-hmm. to travel on. And and you're that, talking about a platform for people with unreasonable views to make those. Yeah, I, I, more I, widely projected. I just feel Welcome like... Welcome to the Football Rebel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Luckily, we came along. Yeah. Uh, and, no, uh... no, but I, I feel like a lot of it, not all of it, like you say, Marcus, the Man United Decisions one is a good, actually, actually a pretty good example I hadn't thought of, but I think that was more about the, the influence maybe that Sir Alex Ferguson was purported to have and May not were the biggest club by far at that point. But I feel like a lot of these types of opinions or conspiracies were really just the 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 domain of the guy in the pub who's a bit of a bore. And occasionally he'd find another guy in the same pub that was a bore and they'd be a bit of a pair. But, al- but, al- <laughs> <laughs> but ultimately, when it left the pub, it had no, really nowhere to go. I know like. what you mean, yeah. So, so we, we had that issue. So that that's why it's, be- I think, become more prevalent. And I think the issue now isn't that we're not happy with our team losing or our team not being very good or blah, blah, blah. It's that we think there's some kind of nefarious you know, hidden hand behind this that is making us lose or making us not be... It's, it's an entitlement have. thing, really. And it happens with mostly partly because there's more of them and partly because they get more coverage, but also because um, they're entitled. Mm. It happens with fans of big clubs. Mm. Now, it just so happens, as we sit here today, we've seen a lot of stuff over the last couple of weeks off the back of Howard Webb being in the stands for a game. A lot of Arsenal fans are crying foul about this. And and so that's, that's the kind of... That's me setting the scene... 
I think we've definitely, I agree with Carlos, I've noticed it as well. We see people far more likely to sort of talk about how there's some kind of reason for it rather than just accepting that maybe they, they weren't the better team on the day or across the season they weren't, they weren't um, the best team. Of course, in, in the mix of all that is all these charges against Manchester City that people are running right with and that's a kind of a little bit of a lightning in a bottle as well because that's something that we'll, we, we hope is going to be resolved by the end of the year and we'll find that one way or another. Will people accept that result? Depends on the result, but I suspect probably not mm. and the whole thing will rumble on because that's the era we live in. When, he goes, when it comes to the question about... Um, what role do pundits and social media play in either fueling or fighting these narratives? Well, the social media thing I've talked about, it obviously fuels it because mm-hmm. uh, everyone gets a voice and you you, a lot of times you don't know who these people are and, and a large percentage of them are fucking maniacs. The pundits <laughs> and the broadcasters thing I think is really important, particularly as we talk about it here today because we're broadcasters as well and we're pundits you know, as well. Look, I think people have to understand they've got a really, really big responsibility when they've got a platform and they're talking about these kind of issues, whether they're a journalist, whether they're a pundit, whether they're a, a host or, or an ex-player or whatever. And I think far too often now, pundits are fueling this potentially without properly realising they're doing it, uh, partly because they're not clever enough and they believe it, and partly because they think it's a way of getting clout. And that is really irresponsible in your role as a broadcaster. There are people out there who have been in the past quote unquote credible journalists who still see themselves as credible journalists who are basically masquerading as journalists but are essentially conspiracy theorists and because of the background they've got and because of the way they present themselves it's got a lot more weight and I don't I see too many of them doing this stuff on social media without the sources without without having to without being able in their role as a journalist to get these stories in mainstream publications that can be trusted backed up by sources and until they do that they're basically crying conspiracy theories um and that is further damaging it massively because they seem they have the appearance of credibility so all that mixed together Mm -hmm. is a massive issue how it's sorted i have no idea but i have no idea how the wider society is going to sort themselves out well you you said something there in, in, in how it could be helped at least is for the pundits and the broadcasters to take a more responsibility and be a little bit more robust yeah, yeah, with yeah. this kind of thing. I, I understand that that's not going to make it go away. I don't think you ever can make this go away, but I think you probably would seek to minimise it. But Andy, do you have any thoughts on how it, how this can be addressed? Yeah, I don't, I don't think the pundits and the, and the broadcasters are the main thread of this. I, I think we're talking about something that is very much a, a Premier League-based phenomenon here because what i have noticed in the last couple of years is the the premier league fans have fallen in line with fans of other major european leagues Mm -hmm. that is not a positive thing by the way so this idea of a decision that goes against your team or decisions that go against your team being a big conspiracy Mm -hmm. this has been alive and well in italy and Spain, Spain and Portugal. Turkey, Andy, could be to that time. list. <laughs> <laughs> you, you could. What about so, the um, ex-referee in Spain with the parrot? Oh, well, there you go. You know what I mean? But, uh, yeah, but, but you were going to say, Andy, yeah, that Premier uh, League fans are now, unfortunately, in line perhaps with us. Yeah, and I think a huge part of that is, uh, obviously, it's accelerated by social media, but a huge part of that is VAR. And a huge part of that is the way that VAR was sold to us mm. as a community of Premier League fans. Mm -hmm. So, whereas I've said before on here, I'm sure, and certainly on OTC, about how different countries needed different things from VAR, because there was always the feeling in Italy that, or Spain, for example, that it was a big conspiracy. You needed VAR for that clarity. So the discussion we've always had on here, and again, I've said it before, the way we spend so much time in Premier League circles arguing over decisions that are actually correct is insane to me. That never happens in, say, Italy. If you're like a a Rizzler paper offside, then great. We know it's offside. There's total clarity. No one is ever arguing about that or talking about the spirit of the law or, or, or any stuff like that. But I think the problem here is because we were sold it, I feel, and I think a lot of people feel like this, as it will eliminate all mistakes, which was obviously mm-hmm. never possible. Mm-hmm. Now when that doesn't happen, p- 
people don't look at human error, they go straight to the conspiracy thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But so I think that, it's a, that, has, that has accelerated It has accelerated, that feeling. but it's a further symptom and not a cause. Well, the, I mean, the VAR the, doesn't explain why there are political figures or media conglomerates well, who, are, who are doing and purposely muddying the waters about what's true and what isn't, which no, is, this is, a, this is a part of it. The, the, this, is, this is a broadcastable and quantifiable grievance. That is the difference. It, yeah, and I think I think it's, okay. it's difficult to answer this question and not talk about wider society. I mean, yeah. I would even suggest you could even throw in how how much of a consumer society we are. I mean, you think about your you click of a button from someone delivering pretty much anything you want to your doorstep, mm. and so people think. But I support that football club, and it makes me feel good when they win. I don't like it when they don't win. That referee made took away my so good feeling. So it's an entitlement, feeling. basically. Oh, I do. I do. That, an that's instant a part gratification. Of it. Yes, completely. I think that's a but, huge but, part of it. Which is why, like, when when if I go and watch Fulham play. Um, as I do fairly often, and uh, you know, the, the, the it's rare but odd occasion, maybe a friend in the away end or something, go, oh, how are you feeling? I was like, I just had a day out of the football. I feel good. Yeah, right. Do you know what I mean? Like a bit of fresh air. Like, like it's, like, it's <laughs> not like the river. I understand Fulham are not going for Premier League titles and and all the rest of it, but like you have to see some of the stuff in in perspective. But that's so difficult to do. You're talking about going into the deep roots of how people think and what makes them think and education and all the rest of it. And so actually to talk about the, the, the causes and the actually to tackle this, it's way too big for football, so, which is why we talk, we sort of nip around the edges because we're, we're talking about it in a football-y context. Well, let's, yeah, let's, I think let's, that's fair. Go, go, I take all those points and I agree with them, but going back to the football then and mm. going back to Andy's point, and I, I do understand it, but I think there's more, much more to it than that. And here, let me give you another example. You know, when there was this big thing about Howard Webb being in the stands at the Arsenal game at Bournemouth mm. and um, a, a, a card is given to a player and the player is sent off, all these people, and this is a, a wide number of people that have done it and are still doing it on social media because I've literally just checked while you were talking on the Sky Sports um, Instagram page that are saying they're leaping to the idea that Howard Webb has intervened Personally, it's incredible. Yeah, yeah. it's incredible. Rather, and, and what's interesting about this, mm. when it comes to this question from Carl specifically, is no one has gone. No one's thought process, it seems, in this case, has yeah. been. Oh, my thought process at the time, which was, yeah. well, Howard Webb's there because he's head of Pugmore, yes. and he's doing his job, and he probably goes to different games every weekend, yeah. and he's on the phone. Fine, he's on the phone. Whatever. He's probably listening into the audio because yes. that's part of his job. Everyone leapt to it and gone, well, he's interfered there. That's yeah. a big conspiracy against Arsenal. And my point is just that that's not because of VAR. That's because people have been conditioned yeah, of course. by football and by society to leap to that conclusion straight away, including mm -hmm. some quite big name quote unquote journalist who in my view are basically conspiracy theorists so why is that happening yeah. that's the question well, it, but, well the question is actually how you do address it and mm. I think one of the things is um, you have to brief pundits and, and you and do you don't properly. fuel into yes. this bollocks it makes everyone's jobs harder and as an ex-player that often pundits are surely you want the referees to do the best job possible don't put them under so much pressure and I think sometimes um, what happens is in in you know a societal context we're talking about football is you then have like Howard Webb is explaining decisions with with Michael Owen on, on his show. I don't think that's a, a terrible thing, but I think it gets to the point where you kind of go, actually, we're bending over backwards here and we're pandering to the morons. If I was Howard Webb, I'd just go, I, 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 of course, I wasn't doing that. Like I'd just be a bit more kind of blunt with it and go, well, that's just nonsense. And actually, here are the stats on VAR; things have improved. And just actually, just try and sort of say these are the mm. facts. So and when every presenter, if they've got pundits in there or whatever, should be briefed and go, well, you're moaning about VAR or you're saying something potentially a little bit naughty or whatever. The fact is, though, that decisions are this percentage more improved thanks to VAR. Just bang, but just that, kill that it. That goes dead. back to your original point that it's a societal thing. Yeah, because you have that on political programs, for example. You do. People People are allowed to run wild yes. with their very cavalier interpretation of the truth and they're very rarely fact-checked mm. or called to account at the time. Yes. And you're right. You need to be well, called to account at the I time. The, Putting out something later, it's like the, you're talking about... The, the horse is bolted. The, yeah, you, exactly. You're talking about the Premier League programme mm. with, uh, with, with, with Michael Owen, for example. It is such a late sum up I'm not saying it's yeah. not useful but it's such a late sum up you probably need it on a Sunday night do you know what I mean like, like yeah. the last word they, they used to they, do it's so stuff. far they, afterwards they do it, it doesn't matter anymore they do it on purpose to do that I think because it, the dust has settled it's much easier but, we, we but you've also got to be but, careful because if this goes on and on and on you know like I mean, referees probably get targeted anyway, but it's like, oh, there's the guy's name, right? Let's find out. So, you so know, exactly. This and is this is 
this is toxic. And that's and that's and that's exactly the right opportunity to bring it back to the Howard Webb thing with the Arsenal game because you know we're talking. Carlos was asking about broadcasters and and you know what's happening with this. Broadcasters should have a code of conduct, yes. which says that if you are an official broadcaster or a representative of the official broadcaster or employed by them, you you are you are within your rights to question mm-hmm. the a decision by a referee. Mm-hmm based on how you understand the laws of the game, which you should know well because you're broadcasting. But who pipes up after the Howard Webb yeah, thing? Exactly. Jamie Carragher. Yeah. Jamie Carragher tweets, was Howard Webb involved in the decision-making of the red car for Saliba when Howard Webb was in the stand? Now, yeah. Jamie Carragher's working for Sky Sports. I know, yeah. And he later deleted that tweet. I don't know why he deleted it. Maybe someone said, look, you can't tweet that. But I like Jamie Carragher. Mm. I've worked with him. I think mm. he's a good guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we all make mistakes. He can't. He cannot be doing that. No, he can't. And we no. cannot have five, six, seven minutes of of coverage of the idea that Howard Webb is in the stands yeah. for a game when there's been a controversial. Decision. And that's where you need the presenter to say and, Howard Webb was seen in the stands. I mean, obviously he's not doing that. Hopefully, but and 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 I know I said this at the start. I said, and we must move on. You'll always get people going. Well, I think this, that, and the other. And you have to. You can't get rid of it because it's such a big thing. Minimalize it, mm. but don't bring it into the mainstream. Absolutely. And I, I think, you know, people. There, there are people out there who should be thoroughly ashamed of themselves and their coverage of not just how refereeing is happening. Because mm. I think it's fine to criticise referees. We do it on the time, all the time on here. We think the standards should be higher. Happy to say that. I think that's different between suggesting there's some kind of big conspiracy behind the scenes to, to do certain clubs mm. out of results, which a lot of people online who are supposed to know better than that um, do a lot and mm. they shouldn't be doing it. I would say, as um, uh, you know, a little bit of advice for referees in this country, do not get a parrot, though. No, dude, that, you that, yeah, no, it's not good. That's look, not helping. No, good That's question though, Carlos. We could talk and talk yeah. and talk for ages about that. I don't um, think. I think it's beyond us to be able to solve it. Uh, for now, yeah. But give us a give us a weekend, <laughs> and we'll come up with something. Okay, this is from Louis, also on the Discord. Hello to you, uh, Louis. Thank you very much for being a part of it. He says, after Arsenal and Bournemouth held their nerve and gave Mikel Arteta and Andoni Iriola a bit more time to prove themselves. Do you think this is why we haven't seen the end of Oli Glasner at Crystal Palace and Gary O'Neill slash Gag O'Neill at Wolves this words it, season? The end of them. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I, th- I think the Arsenal and Bournemouth things are both quite interesting. I mean, in terms of the time they were given, uh, Mikel Arteta got more time than, say, Unai Emery. Yeah because there, it was a recognition of where the club were at that particular time. With Bournemouth, is very different because, and I guess it does show when we were talking about the modern culture of overreaction, what did Iola go? What, 10 games without winning? He it? went a while without uh, I, I mean, getting any results. I can yeah. understand why there was a question, but Bournemouth should not be sacking a coach after 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 mm. 10 games, unless you've like lost all of them, 5-0 or something like that. Um, and I think... Idiola leans a bit more in, as Louis perhaps hinting, to Glasner particularly and O'Neill to a lesser extent. Because with Idiola and Glasner, those clubs have done very, very well to get those coaches. If you fire them prematurely, if you don't give them time, who are you getting that's better? Who are you getting who's as yeah. good? I don't think there's yeah. a clear answer to that. Because it is clear when you look at some of the jobs that Idiola and Glasner have been offered those clubs clearly there's huge cash in being a premier league manager but they have been given a, a great chance really to get those bournemouth and, and and crystal palace and i think there has to be a, a sense of that i mean we saw this in in france last weekend we saw the um president of montpellier laurent nicolas fire their coach is he the son of uh, Louis Nicolas yeah yeah the late uh, Louis Nicolas and um, what a man yeah (laughs) what a man (laughs) and um, so uh, Nicolas Junior he fired their coach uh, Michel de Zakarian during the press conference (laughs) after the after the game he said oh yeah I've just went in there and I, I, I can't sack 25 players I can only sack the coach so I just went in there and Told him in the dressing room in front mm. of every, everyone that that's the Jeez. end for him, and 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 that's How very that. honourable. <laughs> but the thing is, with with that, how you behave as a club really affects who you can get next, because especially as a coach, you look at that and you think, have I actually got mm-hmm. a chance of succeeding there? Now, say if Palace, for example, were to get rid of Glasner at the moment. What coach of a similar sort of level to Glasner, mm. and there are not that many out there because he is an exceptional coach, he's a European um, d- trophy winning coach, 
who is going to say, right, okay, I'm going to have that. Mm -hmm. If like he has like eight to 10 bad games and, and then he's gone. Well, or you might get the, the wrong the coach because you might get a coach go, yeah, bollocks is a Premier League job. I'll make a few quid. Yeah, I'll, I'll give it a crack. You don't want that. Yes. You want someone to look at it and go, right, what have we got here? Really kind of get the yeah. team into it. And I think particularly it. in the case of Palace and, and Bournemouth. Who could and, go up and down. Yeah. Well, the thing is, there's a definite ceiling for both of them. Yeah. But they have taken a decision to put a coach in charge where he gets a bit more of a, a manager remit and they want to change stylistically they want to change image wise i think palace particularly know if they were to get rid of glasner and say bring in david moyes get roy back uh, uh, well that's the example mm, isn't it mm. you know they're straight back to yeah. doing what they were doing treading water with a largely unhappy fan base i think, yeah. I think it's not one size fits all it's all um, context i think i think context is absolutely it's all crucial context. It's all context. and i think as well you know glasner's still got a bit of credit in the bank for what he did last season if you've seen a manager i know i mean you know, ten Hag had a good start with his man united right it doesn't mean everything but you're right i mean there's obviously the financial things you know if you sack him are there clauses in the contract blah blah blah, blah. No, we also have to remember that the, the, the decision makers at these clubs are seeing a completely different version mm of the public-facing version that we're seeing. Well, can they see green shoots? Can they see what, the, yeah. what he's like in training? And, and, and How do the players respond to him? These, All that kind of stuff. Totally. And these four managers that have been named by Louis, well, Mikel Arteta coming off the back of Unai Emery and has been tasked with essentially reinventing mm. the club into a new identity after the Wenger era. And they would have seen so much progress in the background mm. on doing that back their man, realised he was the guy for it. They read the whiteboards before us. Yeah, they see the heart and the brain merge together. They, they, they've they got lemon juice all over their hands and they're thinking this is brilliant, <laughs> right? And, and Dona Iriola is, like, he, he was, he's a really interesting example because they, they looked like from results, they were in a real bad place. Yeah. But people who were watching them were going, look, it's actually not that bad mm -hmm. and it's going to work and people believe in it. And that was that. Glasner is in a situation where he ended last season really well. They had a really tumultuous summer mm -hmm. and they're also, in a way, not the same, but a kind of similar in terms of principle way, Crystal Palace are trying to wean themselves off of Roy Hodgson. Mm -hmm. They are. He's not achieved what Wenger achieved, but he was synonymous with the club. He did such a good job. He's a Crystal Palace fan. He loved the club. The club loved him. And he like, like Wenger, the fans were completely sick of him by the end. Quite. <clears throat> so there's a lot of parallels there. And I think if and Andy's alluded to it, but I'll just be I'll just be more kind of forth typically forthright about it. If they tear up the Glasner thing now, they're, they're a laughing stock because 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 they've they've gone out and they have found someone who's won European trophies, who's who's clearly shown what he can do come off the back of a tumultuous summer that the ownership themselves have contributed to, both in terms of the ownership and the players that they lost. exhausted players. Yeah, and the players, yes. yeah, quite. A few of them. Yeah, yeah. And, and so he needs to be given the time. Gary O'Neill has done a, overall, done a good job at Wolves and has had a really, really tough start. I think he's a really kind of interesting young coach and I think mm. I think they know that as well and that's why they haven't found The, the problem with yeah. O'Neill at the moment, and you, you said earlier it's about context and it absolutely is, the fact that Wolves are losing consistently, even bearing in mind, you know, some of the content of the games that play quite well in some of them, there's a feeling that they've, for me at least, that there's a bit of direction on the on the field, and O'Neill's a huge part of that. That anger is mainly directed from the Wolves fans at Fosun, the owners, mm. because you talked about the owners contributing or the governors of the club contributing to a situation that the manager is having to deal with. We do wonder if the difference is if O'Neill's staying there while the results are bad, from a Wolves supporter's perspective, that's often, well, they're just putting their hands in their pockets and not doing anything. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I think I'll just find on that. I think, you know, it's worth saying that some but, of these games Wolves have played, they've been all right. Mm. They, but, they've run out of steam against Newcastle. I shouldn't have lost that probably. Mm. They, they, were, they, they equalised well against Liverpool. That, that mad 20 minutes against but Chelsea. The, exactly. Yeah. But going back to the, just briefly before we move in the heart of the question is, 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 is basically our teams taking or owners taking inspiration from others and saying, well, they stuck with him. They stuck with him. Maybe, maybe we should do the same because there was a time in the Premier League when it was crazy. The managerial yeah, merry-go-round. So remember, perhaps there is something in that. Well, I remember, I remember, well, that's also to do with the, the profile of the manager that you hire now because yeah. they do certain, they're kind of different now, which mm -hmm. maybe we'll come on to that if we have time. But when, when, they were, when managers were getting fired really quickly, that mm -hmm. period, I remember interviewing Professor Chris Brady, who was, the, that's who was right, yeah. Carlo Ancelotti's um, guy for a while. And he and I was really surprised because I asked him a question about that, 
And he, he covers, he's worth looking up. He's an interesting guy. He covers loads of different stuff. He wrote a book with um, Ancelotti about leadership in football. It's really interesting. And I, and I interviewed him off the back of that book. And, and I said to him, it's mad, isn't it? All these players, all these mm. managers are getting fired. And he said, well, actually, look at this, right? Check this out. I did a study and I did it across loads and loads of managers, across loads of different leagues. And I found there was a threshold mm-hmm. that if a manager wasn't picking up something like 1.8 points per game on average across their first 10 games, like invariably it never got better. Yeah, It never got better. So actually it sounds counterintuitive, yeah. but if you get a manager in place, and this was a while back now, so maybe things have changed, but you get a manager in place and it's clear through results and through performances on not just on the, on the pitch, but on the training field, that players aren't buying into those ideas and they're not on board with it and the results aren't going anywhere, the chances are you've lost your chance. You're not going to get any better. And I think that's really interesting because I remember that and I was actually going to mention it had you not. We often, or people often think, we wasn't given time. Give him time. Not, doesn't if you have a bad start, doesn't mean to say that you can turn it around. And mm. also the other way around as yeah. well. You, you, it's, it, there's so much going on here. It's so tricky because you're not playing fantasy football. You're not playing a computer game. You're dealing with people. And actually, if a coach is showing a little bit of something, and the players think, okay, we're not getting the wins or anything, but we believe in what the coach is doing, and that can be down to tactics and their ability, but also man management as well. You forget the personality side of this. You're trying to lead 25, uh, uh, you know, football players. Very- very different personalities exactly. from very different backgrounds. And also as well, you know, if, if, if people say, but in the 1970s and the 1980s, the world has changed. Massively. And so you have to factor that in as well. And also, it's not just the world. It's, it's footballing landscape has changed as well. If you got relegated in the 70s or 80s, well, you come back up and you'd be challenging for the title the next season, potentially. Well, rare, but you know, do you know what I mean? Very, yeah. very different. It, it, could, it could happen. I mean, I, mean, I, I guess the, the relief for Palace and Wolves, whatever happens, mm. if they don't finish in the bottom three, they're fine. But... Tom has this question on Instagram. Oh. What are your thoughts on introducing relegation playoffs? Could they be a hugely entertaining season-ending thrill? That was a great link, Andy. Good link, Andy. Well done, mate. Hey, get a load of that. Uh, oh, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not up for this. There's too much football. This would be mad. So, yeah, so I think... <laughs> isn't it just talking about a reformatting of the current Well, if playoffs? it's that, mm. if it's that, then I think it'd be cool. Dear. Yeah, I think because um, one of the things that the reason the players were introduced, what was it, and the 87, 89? Fairly, so, uh, fairly 80, recent. 86, 87, and 87, 88 were the seasons they had them. Late 80s. The reason. And they, so Charlton stayed up in the first one and Chelsea went down being replaced by Middlesbrough in the second there you one. Go. That's Ooh, the deal you want. Come on. Um, I always over deliver. Somebody, well, some, somebody check that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, the, the reason for those younger listeners or people who just you know, aren't as boring as us, the reason <laughs> that they were, they were introduced is because people were starting to think that beyond a certain part of the season, there was nothing to play for I for the vast mean, majority of teams, mean, right? So they got it brought yeah, in. Yeah. I, think, I don't think you'll find many people out there don't think the playoffs in the Football League are a good thing. They're good. I well, think that's, I uh, that's fair. Say, that's fair. I, it, it's a difficult thing because I accept it's entertaining and football should be about entertainment. Mm-hmm. It is also patently unfair. And I say that as, bear in mind, the last time my team got promoted, we finished seventh in League Two. Yeah. Seventh. Well, it's, and, yeah. we, and, we, and we still got promoted. Yes, I know you know the rules at the start and we were the best team in the playoffs and exactly. all, all, all that, all that sort of stuff. About. But realistically... When was a third, sometimes a third place team in the in a group table in a big international tournament goes on and does really well. Yeah, but again, you're talking about what happens. We're talking about what's actually right. What I'm talking about was actually. But, I mean, right. if that's the case, the playoffs then... did it did cause a stir. You're right because as people will remember, you fight hard, you finish, you just pipped and you finish third, and then. And then a team who's been sort of fairly mid table It might be 15 points behind you yeah, or 20 w- points behind wins you. Yeah, wins yeah. a few games and they finish sixth. But as Luke rightly points out, the, the, the controversy at the time of the playoffs, to call the playoffs controversial now is, is seen as madness. I mean, we mm. grew up with the playoffs and it was it was just a thing. I remember when Fulham, really good season, but they finished third. And you think, oh, bloody hell. You got to it's go when you just miss out on well, second, isn't it? Yeah. Well, you know, like, yeah. everybody, I think, everybody's I think, had it. I think Andy's argument about um, Wimbledon finished seventh and getting promoted, you know, yeah, I think that's a fatuous argument, and I'll tell you why. Because, because, you know, che- look at the League One table last season, right? Cheltenham Town finished fourth bottom with forty-four points. Mm-hmm. They finished fourteen points above Carlisle United, who came bottom. Mm-hmm. What's the what's the net result? Both get relegated. Yeah, I because, mean, I, we could sit here all day with Cheltenham look, Town fans talking about how much better they were the, than Carlisle. The, the, the reality is, is they weren't good enough. The, the fact is that the playoffs are here, and and by and large, I think. A lot of people, especially those who aren't involved, enjoy them. So, so I, and, it, and, it, it, here's my take on it. Then, go Because I do, I do take the point about the fact there's too much football. And presumably we're answering this question in, a, in an environment where, um, you know, 
it's, the calendar isn't so packed that we can't have any extra football. As a, let's take it as an idea on its own ba- basis. And also the teams that are down there are not going far in cup competitions generally. But yes, I think you're right. I, to say I, th- that. I think that, um, you know, there's so much more football being introduced all the time that's kind of pointless. Mm. Yes, this wouldn't be pointless. It'd be a genuinely exciting end to the season. So you'd be up season. for this? Yeah, it'd be a genuinely exciting end to the season I... because it also, it also, um, it, it solves Andy's problem. Because you, you, you could look into a situation where you go, okay, you finish right down there in the plus, you know we're near third, but you, you know, you're nearer to mid-table than you are third in some cases. Well, the, you could do it in a way where you say, okay, we're going to give you an extra chance. We don't think you're as good as that team there, but we're going to give you an extra chance. A little bit like happens in the, the National League. Exactly. I mean, yeah, there are where, really... where you have a... A Depends. pre-qualifier almost. Exactly. Or, you know, when you, when you look at what happens in Germany, they have a relegation playoff and you mm. have that situation where Hamburg, who had never been relegated, no. for years they had that clock where it was like, yeah. how long we've been in the top flight. Danny Kelly tried to buy that clock when they got relegated. <laughs> Super. <laughs> they went through so many relegation playoffs surviving by the skin of their teeth. It was like an extra bit of excitement mm. to the end of the season. Uh, I, guess, I remember thinking it was really fun. It, it is, but... Not, I, for, not I, for their fans. I, I guess the, the counterpoint of that mm-hmm. is if you look at the, the German relegation playoff, the team that is the team that's hovering over the sinkhole in the top flight almost always stays up. Yeah, uh, and, and that is that is really yeah. sad. And there's been a lot of discussion over that. You know, is is there a fair competitive balance? Yeah. And maybe there isn't. I, I I wouldn't be up for it because I think the last day of the Premier League season tends to be more focused on relegation. I think the relegation scrap is exciting enough as it is. Yeah. And I think the idea that you kind of go, oh my goodness, thank thank, thank goodness on the last day we finished 17th and we got into the playoff rather than going down if it was a German type situation. Yeah, I know what you mean. And I think the excitement of the playoffs is there. I don't think you need to, I don't think you need to do it, Tom, is my answer to your question. Don't do it, Tom. Have a think about it, mate. Yeah, have a think about it. Yeah, this one from Harry. Um, hello to you, Harry. Again on the Discord. Oh, love on our Discord at the moment. Good old has. Um, it says, what are your thoughts on the Barca v Atletico game being played in Miami? Do we think it'll ever happen to a Premier League game? And how can we, as fans, ensure this doesn't happen going forward? Is it happening at the Pitbull Stadium? I don't think it is, Marcus, sadly. Just, we all have our price. Yeah. I think... I think the, the, the Seeing <laughs> Fulham at the Pitbull Stadium. <laughs> hey? <laughs> Go on, <laughs> keep going. <laughs> yeah. I'm all ears. Yeah, uh, he's what he's refing. <laughs> no, it's Howard Webb. <laughs> <laughs> he's in the stands. So pitbull, pitbull. It's a definite pen. <laughs> I, I think. I think. Um, well, Andy, why don't you just give us an answer? Well, so the, <laughs> oh, fuck it, this is yet to be rubber stamped. By, by the right. by the way, and, and, and presumably this is this is happening because La Liga are a a little bit more flexible about it than the Premier League have been, and b there's a big Spanish culture in Miami and so it's seen as like a, a genuinely good thing to do for fans of this league that don't live in that country is that fair? That's mm, a very very generous, very generous interpretation well, of I'm it. not saying I agree I would, with it I'm, 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 I would I'm, say, let me be clear is that the question was from me wasn't that oh, I think this is a good idea it was is that what's been given as the justification that, for that's happening? how it's going to be presented why is it, Absolutely. that's probably why it's Miami and not Dallas yeah right uh, yeah. there are, there are a, a couple of things here um firstly it's, it's it's all about opportunity and vulnerability and i think the fact that barcelona are not playing at home at the moment obviously they're in Montjuic. Uh, they're hoping to be back in camp no um very soon as you'll see on otc youtube i did a video about that that's that should be out now do subscribe to the otc youtube channel by the way oh yeah There's so much good stuff on there yeah it's fun um but b- because barcelona are in a sort of home that their fans hate away from home at, at, at the moment. Maybe there's an opportunity mm. as well. Of course, Barcelona uh, also already tried to play a game in 1819 against Girona um, in, in Miami. So you meant 2018-19, not the year 1819, yeah. which confused me momentarily. Though. Yeah, that's that, that's. <laughs> How long have you been covering the game, man? <laughs> How long has Barcelona been around? <laughs> yeah. It feels that long. But I, I think the, the, the other thing is, and the main thing is, as well as the vulnerability of Barcelona and their current situation, and it's a financial vulnerability as well, it's the fact that La Liga fans put up with all sorts of shit anyway, in terms of like 11 p.m. kickoffs yeah. in the past and stuff like that. The authorities, frankly, know these fans can be walked over. And so if authorities can do that, they certainly will. But, uh, there would be that such, over football, yeah. su- but there would be such a great a pushback against this Mm -hmm. in the Premier League, for example. I remember if we go back some years to when um, Arsenal uh, and Leicester moved a game that was at the Emirates with, I think, 
five weeks notice mm-hmm. and fans were really annoyed about this they're like come on we've booked tickets yep. already train tickets and hotels and taking time off work and find, found babysitters and all that sort of stuff was the re- reaction in say spain and portugal was like are you joking yeah but you don't we, have, we normally get about 10 minutes yeah, but you don't have a, you don't have a culture of away fans though, that's why i was gonna say that. because of that though you, is that a big reason yeah it's a huge part of that you, do you get, get, it's tricky you if you're going to go over city break and you think i'll get a bit of football in and you want to go to spain it's like change really late on, hang yeah. about they're playing on the sunday night now My yeah, or, or, or if they're playing on the monday night yeah or, exactly or, or, or whatever you're, you're you're stuck but you know you, you can get fans uh you can get clubs who get great away support like betis or, or, or one of those for example but it's harder to do yeah, if makes you sense. if if you if you have that culture, um, can I can I just chime in? Chicken and egg. We, sure. Yeah, I, I get that. I think that's fair. Uh, last time I had a question of this similar nature was a few months ago, and I gave an answer that a lot of people criticised me for. Mm. Um, How dare they? I know. No, no, I, I I accept it. It's part of the part of the part of the territory, Marcus. And mm. some of my opinions are quite frankly garbage. So it's absolutely <laughs> fair enough. Um, but but I. I <laughs> what I the reason I answered it the way I answered it, and I'll, I'll try and do it in a more, more finessed way this time, is that. What I think there is present in these conversations which aren't going away, and there's a reason they're not going away, which we all know, there's a there's an absence of um and there's, there's almost like a cognitive dissonance from fans of Premier League clubs about this issue. Mm. And let me explain what I mean. And I said this before and I'll say it again now. If you are someone who supports a club and glories in the fact that, for example, I'm just picking an example top of my head. Manchester United buy Anthony for 100 million, right? Mm-hmm. That comes with a cost. It comes with a cost literally because he costs that much money. Mm-hmm. However, they start to structure the payment, but mm-hmm. they're paying a lot of money for a player. And that money's got to come from somewhere. Now, but that, where that money comes from in the Premier League is, of course, not just domestic TV rights, but international TV rights. And you, you cannot be in a position as a fan where you are happy. And you are in some cases, which I've seen, boasting that your club gets that player because they can pay him 300 grand a week and that club can only pay him 200 grand a week. And you're happy about that and not expect at some point to pay the piper. The reality is this is where in big sport is going. Mm. And in the US, it's different because they don't have a culture at all of going to a, what they call road games as much. And they're a lot more commercially minded anyway. But this has been happening and is part of the furniture in like the NFL and other sports in the US for a long time now. Yes. And at some point, you know, the Premier League decision makers are going to want to take um, clubs to other countries. Do I agree with it? No, I fucking don't. Mm. Do you think, do but you I think get why so? they're doing it. I totally understand. I can draw the fucking oh, they, link. I mean, they will be tempted regularly. And they're doing everything around it yeah. already. I mean, when, when Richard Masters was asked about this earlier this year... He said the old classic, we have no current plans to do it. Like, I, like I haven't currently got a plan to have a beer on the way home, but I probably will. <laughs> right? and, 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 the other, and the other thing is, he also then, tellingly, I thought, mm-hmm. started saying stuff like, well, we're also really excited about uh, the summer series we're doing overseas. Yeah, I mean, Premier League teams. We know what they're, they're doing. They're doing everything yeah, they can already. But so, think... so the reality is, if you took it, I'll come on to you in a minute, Andy, but the reality is, you know, what do we do as a fan base to understand this doesn't happen going forward? The only thing that's going to stop it is a Super League type protest. Yes. And even that's probably only going to stop it temporarily because whether you like it or not, football fans that have been listening to this, Premier League fans, I mean specifically, of certain clubs, you have been a part of this. Perhaps passively, but you've been a part of it. You accepted it. And if you accept it, at some point you have to pay the bill. I that's mean, how I feel about th- th- it. This is, this is what it all goes back to, really, what it is to be a, a football fan. Now, unfortunately, there are a lot of people out there who believe um, being a loyal fan is protecting your club against anything even uh, indefensible actions or is that a conspiracy theory well I did I mean that feeds into the question your job as a football fan is to realise that the club is yours and you need to hold your owners to account all the time and that should be your default position Um, but I think in terms of the, the, the Premier League fans where and Premier League clubs, where we disagree slightly, Luke, is the fact that I don't think this is necessarily an imminent threat for the Premier League. Because you have to ask, why are La Liga doing it? To catch up financially. Mm, They're looking at every possible avenue of catching up with the Premier League. So this is why they're they're first out the gate. Now these two tides were signed up for the Super League as well. Yes. Yes. Mm. That's that's right. They were they they were they were two of the three, weren't they? So but 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 that's that's fine. But that's only if you think that Premier League are somehow going to turn around and go, yeah, we've got enough money now. We're, we don't need any more. 
we're, we're fine with the money. We don't want to. We don't want to carry on pushing into new markets. No, I, I don't. I don't think it's. I don't think it's about that. They're, they're already successful in new markets, so much more successful than those other leagues, without having to yeah. take games over there. And if you look mm -hmm. at the second most successfully commercial league internationally. It's the Bundesliga. They will never have one yeah. of these games abroad. But, and they, that's have found completely other, different. they have found other ways to connect okay, with fans in overseas markets. Let me put it another way just to convince you then. And I'll do it in the form of a question. <laughs> how many... <laughs> You're buttering me up here. This how is very many, Chris Tarrant here. How many... We don't want to give you that. <laughs> <laughs> Can I phone Marcus? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, how many Premier League clubs are currently owned in part or in whole by American people. That is a fair point. And why is that happening? And what actually goes on mm. when decisions are made for the Premier League mm. on big issues? Well, it's the clubs that vote on it. And the clubs that vote on it yeah. are all owned by Americans, which could happen in X amount of years' time. It will fucking happen. But what the Super League and the protests have made clear is that they realise in German football culture there are certain things that you can't push through. But the authorities over here realise that you have to pick your battles as well. Yeah. And is there going to be enough money made from it to make it worthwhile? Is there going to be enough of a global spread in terms of exposure to make it worthwhile? Maybe not. Maybe not because you've already got a situation where you're globally the biggest league by quite a long but, way. But you were, but you were, but it's not. It's not. Sorry, Marcus. It's not just about the league. You've got to look at, say, for example, take it whichever measure you want to look at. Look at a different measure. Look at the value, the financial value of Premier League clubs compared to their American sports franchise counterparts. If if if, if Man United could get into a situation where I don't know why I'm picking Man United, any any no, but, I mean, any huge team, club, yeah, yeah. It's, it's the, the, if, if 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 they could go and build a brand in the US by going there twice a season, every season for 10 years as part of their long-term plan. Of course they want to do that because yeah. it's about the money. It's about yeah, the... Of course. America's the golden goose, the economy there, the market there's gigantic compared to the UK. Yeah. So so it's, I, do think, I do think it's naive in a way to not think it's going to happen. I'm not saying it's going to happen now. I'm saying it probably will happen at some point. And if you don't believe me, mm -hmm. go and look at the article that Dan Sheldon did in The Athletic uh, a couple of months ago and look at the answers Richard Masters gave. It's mm. obvious. You know, he's not saying it, but you can just read between the lines. Is there a compromise? And because we like our we like our you know Premier League season, we, we you, you you've got your certain amount of home and away games. Like create another game, like a thirty ninth game. <laughs> that was two thousand eight, right? That's crazy. It'd be interesting to see what the reaction to that would be now, sixteen years on. It'd I'd be different. I reckon it'd be different. They'll come back to it somehow. I reckon they will. It'll be yeah. a thirty eight plus one. Okay, <laughs> yeah. So if you Google it, you, it's like the Germany club yeah, ocean. It's a German <laughs> lexicon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, we're going to finish uh, with this question from Eddie on Instagram. Uh, he says, "Which Premier League manager would be best as an actual general in a Spartan-style battle situation?" Nice one, Eddie. Bring us what, back down to earth. What does that mean? Like when you're completely outnumbered? Um, interpret it how you will whether you're outnumbered or you've got um, an extremely handy army and you think how can we utilise these guys and go I, into battle I don't think you get enough Eddies these days mm, so you're going Eddie how th yeah T I th Tyndall I <laughs> Tyndall's your sacrificial lamb <laughs> send him out there to treat with the enemy get yeah. slaughtered go on who, who do you think um, i tell you who I left le to mind maybe two that you might not have um, thought of straight away and you're not going to like the first answer it's basically it's, this is on aesthetics Russell Martin does look a bit Gerard Butler like. He does. Yeah. Okay. You probably have the formations right. Uh, yeah, yeah. 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 And you just get hammered. Uh, yeah. Oh no, they're I'm, I'm, they're attacking us. I'm perfectly <laughs> happy for Russell Martin to lose a bloody battle. Thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs> no problem with that. You didn't have to say bloody. <laughs> um, I th there's a few. I think I think Arnest Slot. Sometimes you need a calmer head. Go, Shiny right. head, don't it? Yeah. But if you think about, if we're talking about Sparta and that famous battle, of course, then to get them fired up and right, stuck in, yes, but you also need to be very disciplined. Neil Warnock. But I think, I think, I, um, I think Thomas Frank. Really? He's got that stare. I think he's yeah. a guy you'd go to war with if you put a headband on with that hair. Well, that's like, it. When we talk, I'm, 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 I'm sold. When yeah. we talk about warriors, mm. everyone immediately thinks of like Sean Dyche, don't don't they? Do they? But like, yeah, I think so. I don't think Luke did. But I think like, the mask has slipped with Sean Dyche. No. You think? Yeah, yeah. They're Go fucking on. crap. <laughs> Every sort of crap. <laughs> like, what, when someone gonna someone's gonna talk about Sean Dyche at one at some point and gonna go, actually, that used to be true, but actually he's been manager for ages now and they're crap. But what? I, but I've got I've got to take you back to the question, Luke. 
I, I, I would I would say that pro- I you can see Tommy Frank. I can see Tommy Frank. I like that. Yeah. For me, when you put a headband around Tommy Frank, he becomes the reliable w- Willem uh, Dafoe in uh, in um, Platoon. I was about oh, to say, yeah. yeah, he becomes yeah. the reliable, honourable part yeah. of a Vietnam. Uh, war troop, yeah, 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 like, yeah. troops. So, I, I think that would work in Spain. A lot. He's I, a bit like I a think, I think one that we're really missing is 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 Mikel Arteta, and not just because he has that attention to detail mm. of a great tactical general, but because he's buzzing about everywhere. Yeah, but he's on the also, touchline. So I think you'd be looking at him from a distance, thinking, "Wow, how many have they got?" Yeah, but I, yeah, I because mean, he'd seem like seventeen different but, men. What about I Marco thought, Silva, little guy in Napoleon? Like, <laughs> yeah, I think Mikel Arteta <laughs> dies in the first five minutes of every war movie ever made. He's that cover <laughs> character. Mm. I, I don't agree. Bit with of that. a busy body, mm. you know, I, 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 quite chippy. Yeah, but Sparta though, yeah. could, it was specifically. Yeah. I suppose he said Spartan style, so he didn't say. It. You're more, you're being more disciplined and, and on on the ball with this question than any of the other ones. I just feel that we have to be. I've a, given you Thomas Frank. I uh, accept it. No, I gave you Thomas Frank. I want it. Right, Andy. Arteta. Right, there we go. Thanks for listening <laughs> to the Football Ramble. I love that. There was probably more arguing about that than many other <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Thank you very much. Super League's fine. For li- <laughs> listening to the Football Ramble Mailbag, part of the ACAST Creator Network. Do get your questions in for next week's episode. Follow us on X, TikTok and Instagram at Football Ramble and subscribe on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. But a huge thank you to all of you who who, who um, messaged us well, there. Well, we put the call questions. out, didn't we? And we got and, 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 and we did. delivered. But, I mean, we always thank everybody because without, the, without you, this show quite simply wouldn't exist. So thank I, no, you, I'd thank you, thank you. It. True. We've got one here from from uh, a, a, a Muke Law. Oh, yeah, you have to hurry up because I'm not going to work. We've <laughs> <laughs> got no listeners. Uh, there we are. Have a lovely Saturday. Have a lovely weekend. We'll yeah. see you on Monday. See ya. Thank you for watching a clip from the Football Ramble podcast. Uh, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss an upload. A single upload. Don't miss out on the uploads. The uploads are in. Impl-